Ray Dalio, hedge fund manager, co-chief investment officer at Bridgewater Associates, the world's largest hedge fund. He went to Harvard, started the fund in 1975. He's 72 years old, worth $20 billion. And a handful of years ago, he put out a book called Principles, which sold over 2 million copies. So I'm sure today, if you asked him how he's doing, he'd say, I'm good. I'm pretty good. Well, he's back with another, and I can't help thinking that it's a big personal response of his to the pandemic. This guy has been studying markets for the last 50 years. So in this book, he's like, well, what's the future going to look like compared to the past? This is the type of topic that you could expect easily from an author like Yuval Noah Harari or Nassim Taleb. So I was definitely surprised by it. I didn't review principles and I listened to it a while ago, so I don't remember that much of it, but I don't think he talked that much about investing specifically in it. It seemed like it was more life and management lessons he learned over the years in and out of Bridgewater, but this could not be the same at all. Like, like at all. Could it? Let's talk about it. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Sam and I want to make self-growth normal because people shouldn't have to look this information up. It should just be mainstream knowledge. If you agree, then please make sure to smash that like button. This book seems like a series of big, big concepts falling under the umbrella of an even bigger concept, the order of the world and how it's changing. So this touches upon giant cause and effect relationships and how to adapt to them. He stressed that the swinging of conditions from one extreme to the other is the norm and not the exception. And no economic system or currency lasts forever, but it's pretty typical for us to freak out when they fail. Why is this? Dalio has to study long-term changes for his job, not for academic purposes. And again, he's been doing this for 50 years. So he summarizes all that he's learned in a simple archetype of the rises and falls of giant empires around the world. Then he talks about 18 determinants of what causes those rises and falls. And then he covers the three cycles that change that world order. The chapter, The Big Cycle in a Tiny Nutshell, touched upon construction and reconstruction periods. They result in financial harm and even and death. People who have survived them said, however, that they brought important things over time, like drawing us closer together, building strength of character, learning to appreciate the basics, and so on. The patterns, Dalio said, are not precise, like they're not exactly the same, but he's definitely able to identify and explain what they have in common. It would be hard to imagine anyone else writing a book like this one. Maybe Warren Buffett, maybe Benjamin Graham, maybe, but one of them's dead, and the other one hopefully can live longer than Betty White did. Again, you're talking about half a century of experience and an unconventional way, for sure, of looking at things. Dalio, for anybody who doesn't know that much about him, has been referred to as the Steve Jobs of investing. The next chapter, The Determinants, I'm going to make a video about this chapter, I think I already did, and the actual determinants, but this confused me at first because he said that there are eight determinants, okay? Eight determinants, but according to the PDF accompanying the audiobook, there were seven additional determinants. And if there were seven additional determinants, why didn't you just say there were 15 determinants? Then he adds in the three cycles of change and it seems like he adds those as determinants. So you're talking about 18 determinants, but when he went over all of them together, I counted 22. So I made a video about those 22 determinants. So many determinants. Determinants is a weird word. When you say determinants so many times, it makes me think of detergent. The big cycle of money, credit, debt, and economic activity. You have to understand how money and credit work to understand how they changed the world in 1933, or how World War II was won and lost, and how the New World Order was created in 1945. Money and credit have timeless and universal fundamentals. Money comes in and money goes out. There's revenue and expenses, and this makes up your net income. It's pretty simple. Like, if your income stopped coming in, how long would you last with your current expenses? And what about if it were cut in half? These equations are put together to consider your economic well-being. By the chapter, The Changing Value of Money, all right, I have to be honest with you guys. At this point in the review, I took maybe a two-week long break from this book. As much respect as I have for Ray Dalio, I don't think it's because I found it boring. Rather, at this point, it was kind of hard for me, at least, to understand. But after what I'm saying now was written during a four and a half hour drive back home after that Christmas break that I had. And you know what I'm talking about. You know that 
post-Christmas break drive back home. You know I had nothing to do and you know that the universe had to throw me right back at this book and it was meant to be. The run on the currency and the devaluations typically occur alongside the debt problems often relating to wartime spending. For example, the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War for the Netherlands, the World Wars for the UK, and the Vietnam War for the US, which put pressure on the central bank to print. If you like his book Principles, that does not mean that you need to check this book out, okay? I did not find them alike at all, really. In the big cycle of internal order and disorder, this chapter explored the timeless and universal cause-effect relationships, like I said earlier, that shape the internal orders and behaviors and shifts that drive periods of order and disorder. For anyone who doesn't know, and I don't know why I went this long without explaining it. When he says changing world order, he's talking about like when the power levels change of different countries. When the power levels change of different countries, that causes a change in the world order. That's what a change in the world order is. He compared internal order changes, something huge, huge, not huge, but huge, huge, to something small, but still very scary, like the development of a cancer. Just as stage three is different from stage four in ways defined by different conditions that have come up as a result of things that have happened in prior stages, the same is true about different stages in a cycle. It's written in a way that makes abundantly clear the unmatched research that Dalio has done on this robust topic over the years. By the way, I completely agree with him when he says that we are in an era where sensationalism, commercialism, and political desires to manipulate people's views have superseded accuracy and journalistic integrity as the primary objectives of most of those in the media, and that this is like a cancer that threatens our well-being. So many cancer references in this book makes me think he's onto something. I don't know what that means, but if it's something bad, I'd like to hear it from a doctor. The big cycle of external order and disorder. Relationships between people in the external and internal orders and disorders work in the same way and they actually blend together. In fact, for a while, people didn't think there was a difference between the internal and external order and disorders. But the difference is that external relations, which by the way means relations between countries, they are driven by raw power dynamics because all governments, systems require different laws, judification, executions and punishments. There are five different kinds of fights between countries and when I heard these it really opened up my mind to how often wars happen that don't directly involve the military. Trade and economic wars, technology wars, capital wars, military wars, and geopolitical wars. Throughout the chapter Dalio includes examples of all of these. For people like me who sometimes don't have too much of an idea regarding what he's talking about, he does include a conclusion at the end of each chapter. If you're an investor, the chapter called Investing in the Light of the Big Cycle is for you. Plain and simple. The next section is called How the World Has Worked in the Last 500 Years, which is not something that most people think about every day. The whole second part tells you how the current cycle of basically the way things work, how that cycle has worked for the last 500 years. A lot of this stuff like the Civil War and Martin Luther King and Germany, I had to learn about in like seventh grade history class. Well. Not a lot of it. It really hit me in this chapter that nothing systematic controlled by humans lasts forever. Like it probably hit me like nothing else in my entire life and I'm almost 25. Oh my gosh, I'm almost 25. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> I've been on this earth almost half as long as Ray Dalio has been doing this. <sighs> Like there's a rise and a peak and an eventual fall and then something else takes its place. And that's just how things work. If you've had a long drive home after Christmas, break like myself actually pretty recently, you may have seen, depending on where you were driving, those mountains going up and down with others behind them. And if you've seen those mountains going up and down with others behind them, you get it. You, you get it. Don't lie, you get it, you understand. The big cycle rise and decline of the Roman Empire and the pound. Here's, what, here's one part that stood out from this chapter. There was a new world order set out by the winners followed by a period of relative peace and 
and prosperity. That is, when the British Empire became the greatest empire ever. At its peak, with only 2.5% of the world's population, the British Empire produced over 20% of the world's income and tr controlled over 20% of the world's landmass and over 25% of the global population. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I found this one much more interesting than the previous one, the big cycle rise and fall of the Dutch Empire and the Gilder, because of how quickly the capitalist system in the UK grew throughout the 1700s. Like, it seems like it just sped past the Dutch Empire during the 1800s. And these cycles, it seems, are almost implied to happen pretty much everywhere. Like, the bigger the scale, the more it applies. Look at Fortune 500's company stock histories. Like, aside from that, it really sounds like Britain just grabbed Europe by the balls. And I found it interesting how those years of innovation, following that was this huge wealth gap. And following the wealth gap was this depression with extremism and populism just filling the streets. It almost makes me wonder, you know, what's coming for the United States, right? Speaking of the devil, the big cycle rise and fall of the United States and the dollar. Who knew that the biggest differences in the US during the mid and early 20th century came from just changes in education. Everything from military to medicine to technology. I love the way that the, the big cycle and rise and fall of all these chapters, I love the way that he introduced them. And finally, the big cycle rise of China and the renminbi. Like the way he introduced this one was incredibly respectful. In fact, this chapter was definitely my favorite, which surprised me because I never thought about it, but I never would have expected the history of China to be so vastly different from the history of the US. When you live in the US and you do what you do every day or what I do every day, it's just not something that you think about. Dalio said that since his first visit there in 1984, he's gone to learn a lot about them and their culture, and he's learned that it is not what so many of us think. So he advised to put aside any preconceived notions of what the media in the US has displayed China as. And then he explained how like the history of China goes back thousands of years, and it can be so deep and complex in comparison to America that there's actually debate as to what happened and when. Nothing like the debate in America. But the leaders in China do take its history into account when making their own decisions today. Then you have the chapter US-China relations and wars. Let's just say this guys, Dalio had way too much to say about China to simply add his input into one chapter of the 14, which took up an eighth of the book. So he added it into this chapter as well. And this whole section about US and China relations was just unmistakably balanced in viewpoint. <laughs> Seriously. Here's one part that stood out from this chapter. What works best varies according to A, the circumstances, and B, how people use these systems are with each other. No system will sustainably work well. In fact, all will break down if the individuals don't respect it more than what they individually want, and if the system isn't flexible enough to bend with the times without breaking. The future's the next chapter, and that was a very investor-friendly chapter, although maybe not as much as the one about investing in the light of the big cycle, but ultimately, there are a lot of people nowadays who have been saying for a while that America is going down and China's gonna become the dominant world power. This is something that for a while I disagreed with because it's like, come on, man, it's, it's America. Like, America is so powerful. Like, we've survived so much. We're so resilient. Obviously, we're not perfect, but we're innovative. We have an unmatched military and all. However, Dalio proposes very, very, very so thoroughly throughout the book that it is true. And I think anyone who disagrees and anyone who thinks that America's gonna be the top world power forever, like, and China's not overtaking it or anything like that. I think anyone who thinks that and disagrees with Dalio might enjoy this book because he explains it in a very balanced way that says, this is just the way things are. This was inevitable. It has been like this literally forever. Quotes. Money and credit are stimulative when given out and depressing when they have to be paid back. That's what makes money an economic growth so cyclical. In this stage, they have to be much more politically astute because the enemies are much less apparent. Power prevails and wealth and power among equals is rarely given up without a fight. As the Chinese know very well, and it'd be good for others to keep in mind, the best way to fight a war is to get strong and show the opponent one's strength so that it doesn't have to fight violently. Direction 1. The author said that his main objectives are to convey to us a single digestible story of the last 500 years that shows how and why history rhymes with what's happening today and to help us make better decisions so we all have a better future. And I agree with him. If that's something you'd be interested in, I recommend this book for you. Direction 2. If you like this book, you might like The Intelligent v Investor by Benjamin Graham. You also might like Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb. Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order by the Late 
great Ray Dalio. There's a link in the description if you guys want to check it out and read the reviews, that and all the other books that I mentioned in this video if you want to check those out too. If there are any other books that you guys want me to check out and review, please let me know in the comments below. Also let me know if you checked out this book and you liked it. But hey, make sure to smash that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, because I don't get why people watch this far in my videos and they don't subscribe. But if you have subscribed and you want to turn it up just a notch and turn on that notification bell to get a notification whenever I drop new videos, that would mean the world to me. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. You can find me everywhere and I will see you then.